three in one three in one program of organic and biofertilizer technology. I am Novalia Kusumarini, will be the moderator of today's guest lecturing. Before we go to the program, again, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to the Excellencies, Head of Soil Science Department, Brawijaya University, Dr. Syahrul Kurniawan, Lecturers of Soil Science Department, Guest Lecturer from Wageningen University and Research, Professor Thomas Kuiper, and all of the audiences who follow this lecturing, both from Zoom meeting and YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, in the second day of guest lecturing, we will learn about managing mycorrhizas in agriculture. Yesterday, we have learned about mycorrhizal symbiosis between fungi and a plant root, which beneficial for crop. Since we understand the benefit of mycorrhizal symbiosis to agricultural plant, should we increase the number of mycorrhizal population through biofertilizer application? Moreover, most plants naturally forming mycorrhizal symbiosis. And this afternoon, we will have a great opportunity to learn about managing mycorrhizas in agriculture. And we are lucky here that Professor Kuiper, Professor of Soil Biology from Wageningen University and Research Netherlands, is joining with us to continue his explanation about mycorrhizas. Before we start the program, I would like to greet Professor Kuiper. Professor Kuiper, welcome back to Bravija University. How are you today, sir? I'm doing fine, thank you. It's my pleasure having you back here. And ladies and gentlemen, moving forward to the main agenda, we are really happy to learn about managing mycorrhizas in agriculture. As I mentioned before, that mycorrhizas naturally forming in most of plant roots but should we manage uh, mycorrhizas to increase its benefit to the plant? Before we gave the answer, first allow me to read the curriculum vitae of our guest lecturer in case there are some audiences did not attend yesterday guest lecturing. Our guest lecturer, our guest lecturer is Professor Thomas Kuiper. He is soil biology uh, group. Wageningen University and Research Netherlands. His expertise are soil fertility, soil biology, mycology, terra preta, mushrooms, mycorrhizas, fungi, lactosols, and soil ecology. He has been write a lot of publication. Those three are his recent publication about microbial diversity, about root trains and colonization by arbuscular mycorrhizas. Professor Piper, I'm sure that everyone is waiting for your presentation. We have time until 16.40 Indonesian times or 11.40 Netherlands time for listening to your presentation and discussion. For discussion session, Please, for the audience who have some question, you can raise your hand by clicking raise hand uh, icon in Zoom room or type your question in chat room. Then I will mention your name and you can start asking your question. For the audiences who follow this lecturing in YouTube, you can type your question in comment room and the committee will help uh, to read your question. During the presentation, please stay mute your microphone. Now it's time to listening to the presentation. Professor Kuiper, time is yours. Thank you very much, Novalia, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you just saw my uh, curriculum vitae, and maybe some of you don't know what this terra preta is that I have been working on. And well, if you look at that picture that she just showed, you see a red tropical soil and next to it, you see a much darker uh, soil that has much more soil organic matter. And such soils have been made by humans. And so they are a clear case of soil improvement because many of the things I'm going to say today 
is about the don'ts of management, the mistakes that we make. But we should not forget that not only science, but also farmers' practices have managed to improve soil quality. And I think that is an important message to start with. And let me check whether screen sharing will work today. Does it work now? Yes. I can see okay, it. good. Then we can start right ahead with the presentation. And so, as mentioned today, I will discuss with you the management of mycorrhizas in agriculture. Of course, we could also reflect on managing mycorrhiza in silviculture when it comes to the growing of Miranti trees. But for the time, I only will restrict myself to agriculture. And the reason for doing that is that in the Netherlands, there has always been a lot of discussion whether that is useful. Uh, our country is characterized by very intensive agriculture that you could almost call industrial agriculture. And the argument is that in our agricultural systems, we supply so many nutrients that it's not likely that plants will benefit anymore from the mycorrhizal symbiosis. And even worse, as some people say, well, there may not be benefits, but still the plants have to pay for the mycorrhizal symbiosis. So in fact, our productivity may be less with mycorrhiza than without it. People have also noted, and I will come back to that later, that in modern agriculture, we may have been breeding crops that are unlikely to depend on or to derive benefit from mycorrhiza. And so we may also have the wrong genetic variation for agriculture to benefit from it. And then finally, we have other management practices about which I will come back, uh, like the intensive soil disturbance by tillage, that they are too low to provide any benefit. And of course, this highly intensive industrial agriculture may characterize agriculture in the Netherlands. And so the question for you would be, to what extent does it apply to the countries in Southeast Asia? And for sure, there are highly intensive agricultural systems, like some systems in which they grow oil palm or in which they grow crops for the industry. But there can also be many cases where relatively resource poor farmers um, have agricultural systems that are very different from ours. And so we need to reflect whether mycorrhiza can be important in such agricultural systems and what farmers can do. So let us start with this picture, which shows that the benefits that plants derive from mycorrhiza depends very much on the amount of phosphorus that is available. So that's mineral uh, phosphorus or the phosphate in the soil solution. And you can see that if you increase your fertilizer level, then uh, more and more the benefits goes down. We should realize two uh, other messages in this picture in which I will come back. First is that the y-axis, uh, the mycorrhizal benefit, is what we call the relative benefit. So it indicates the increase um, in percent of the mycorrhizal plant compared to the mycorrhizal plant. But farmers are, of course, not only interested in relative increases, but in the absolute biomass of plants. And so while it may be the case that here, the response to mycorrhiza is smaller than, let's say, here, it could still be the case that the plants over here are, in general, much larger. And that's what farmers interest. And we may have made life difficult to translate our knowledge to farmers, by concentrating on this relative effect. The second thing we should realize is that the x-axis here provides mineral phosphorus. And the question is, and we are not 100% um, sure, to what extent organic fertilizers, the green manures, animal manures, etc., that also contain phosphorus, 
would result in the same responses or not. And that would depend on how much pre-phosphate there is. And so some animal manures are very rich in available phosphorus. Some other organic manures like green manures are much poor because most of the phosphorus is still there as organic phosphorus. So be aware this relates to mineral fertilizer, not to phosphorus in organic forms. And here you can see some further cases where you can assess from the plant properties the relative benefit. Here you see what we call the leaf and pea ratio, and that gives some information on the relative amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so if that ratio is low, it means the plant either contains little nitrogen or it contains a lot of phosphorus. And often it's the latter that is the case. If the ratio is high, as you can see here, then the plants contain lots of nitrogen and contain little phosphorus. And such plants that contain little phosphorus have benefit from mycorrhizas. And those plants that have um, enough phosphorus have less benefit. So the other message is that it is not just about fertilizer as such uh, that you need to think about um, in terms of mycorrhiza management, but specifically the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. And many fertilizers, at least what I've seen when I visited for my work countries in Africa, they buy standard fertilizer with N, P, and K. And as we have seen in the previous and this, and also we'll see in the next slide, it matters very much whether you fertilize with nitrogen or phosphorus. So targeted fertilizer, either as mineral fertilizer or through organic fertilizers, would be very important. And so once more to show this effect, uh, we can see that if plants have not phosphorus, so if they are nitrogen limited like here, the benefit is much lower than if plants are phosphorus limited, so if they have little phosphorus. So a major message again is when you fertilize, make sure that the balance in your fertilizers between nitrogen and phosphorus meets the demand of the plants and the mycorrhizal fungus and standard fertilizers with NPK in fixed fractions may not always be the best way to spend your money. <clears throat> well, then the other question, and we will come back to that later as well, is that different plants have different benefits from mycorrhiza. So you cannot say you should manage mycorrhiza in each and every cropping system. You may have plants that are non-mycorrhizal, like beets or cabbage. You may have plants that are very strongly dependent on mycorrhiza. And so your plant choice um, should determine the way in which you adapt your mycorrhizal management. And you can see, for instance, that what's called C4 grasses here, which include, for instance, sorghum and maize, generally derive more benefit from mycorrhiza than these three grasses and cereals like wheat or barley or oats. And you can also see that there is a very large variation between the averages, and that has to do because this is averaged over all kinds of plants and all kinds of soil systems. But in general, you can see that maize benefits much more than wheat. And if you ever take a look at the root system of maize and the root system of wheat, then you should immediately realize that this may be linked to the structure of the root system because maize has relative thick roots and wheat has much thinner roots that can be immediately seen and that's how this translates into mycorrhizal benefit and yes as we saw yesterday the plants with the thicker roots in general have large mycorrhizal effect and this is not only a difference between plant species but it can also be variation within plant species which means and i will come back to that later it can be used in plant breeding programs if we want to increase the level of mycorrhizal colonization. 
this is a study of a plant that was originally occurring in the Netherlands, but which was introduced in the United States. And you can see that the plant in Europe, when it is mycorrhizal, makes more biomass than when it's non-mycorrhizal. The same is true in North America, but in Europe, the plant benefits more from mycorrhiza than in the United States. And so people ask, how could that be? Here again, you see that the European plant benefits more from mycorrhiza than the North American plant. And then the people ask themselves, is this related to the root properties? And yes, you can see that the European plants have thicker roots and therefore benefit more from mycorrhiza than the North American plants. This is selection that took place when the plant came, was transported from Europe to North America. But you can immediately imagine that in agriculture, if our breeding programs result in plants with thinner roots, we may also reduce the benefits from mycorrhiza. And the same would be true for what we can call root branching or root fibrousness, as it's called in certain cereals. If we have a much more branched root system, we have a much lower benefit than if we have more coarse, more unbranched roots. And if you go back to my slide yesterday, you can immediately understand why root branching allows the plant to acquire more nutrients by itself and therefore would benefit less from mycorrhiza. So yes, uh, by selecting uh, not only plant species, but also by selecting varieties within plant species, we can, to some extent, influence the mycorrhizal benefit. And as said, I will come back to that later on with the question whether we should use plant breeding, so modern biotechnology, to increase mycorrhizal benefit. <clears throat> we have also seen and I think that is important to realize when it comes to managing the soil rather than managing the plant, that if we have more colonization, and this is the difference in colonization between the control and the mycorrhizal treatment, if we have more colonization, then we have larger yield benefits. So as well, if we breed our plants to be more colonized, we may have larger yield benefits. And also, if we manage our soils so that we have more mycorrhizal colonization, we may have large yields. And this was again recently confirmed, uh, where the increase in mycorrhizal colonization and the increase in mycorrhizal benefits are very strongly correlated. You can also see, um, even though there is a strong relationship, that there is a lot of variation which means that we do not know all the other factors that drive this relationship. We can generalize, but we should realize that the specific context under which farmers or agriculturalists do their work has a large impact on the specific benefit. And of course, many of those studies um, have been done in uh, the greenhouse under controlled conditions where you have non-mycorrhizal control, and then you look at the benefit from mycorrhiza, as you can see here. And you can see that especially in cases where, the non where we really compare mycorrhizal to non-mycorrhizal plants, we have a very large benefit. In the field, however, we have much more the situation that we have lower or higher colonization. It would be extremely rare to find fields without mycorrhiza. So we have more or less mycorrhiza. And so we are more in this area era than just here. And so the mycorrhizal benefit may be smaller, but it may still be there. But we need to ask ourselves uh, when we think about uh, managing mycorrhiza, how much mycorrhizal inoculum is there in the field? Is that enough? What can we do to increase the amount of mycorrhiza? And not only what can we do, 
but also what should we not do? Because good management both consists in doing certain things, but equally in refraining from other things. And one thing we should refrain from is soil disturbance. If we disturb the soil, which we do by plowing or tillage, then we break up the mycorrhizal network, and then that reduces the mycorrhizal benefit. And here you can see the amounts of mycorrhizal colonization with different disturbance levels. This is the undisturbed control, and these are two different disturbance treatments. And we can see that both the plant biomass and the mycorrhizal colonization are much lower with disturbance. And certainly the, the mycorrhizal colonization can recover. As you can see here, if we disturb once, the mycorrhizal colonization is not different from the undisturbed treatments at the end of the season. But still, there is a very large biomass difference. So even if we don't see the effect anymore on the mycorrhizal colonization, the plants tell you that something was wrong at the start of the growing season, where plants contained far less phosphorus and were much smaller than in the other case. <clears throat> and that disturbance is important when we grow certain crops that depend on mycorrhizas. And this is an example of a crop that is very dependent on mycorrhiza, soybean. We all know that soybean and other legumes are very good for sustainable agriculture because they have this ability to fix nitrogen in those nodules. And we can manage the fields uh, for um, having higher yields. And we know that those legumes don't do a poor job if the soil is too acidic. So we know that um, <clears throat> there is, if there is too uh, acid soils, too much aluminum, then the plants will not fix enough nitrogen. But also, as I stated here, if there is too little phosphorus for the plant, nitrogen fixation will also be limited because the nitrogen fixation process demands a lot of phosphorus that needs to be recycled in this chemical reaction. So yes, for soybeans, having those uh, nodules and having healthy reddish nodules by which they fix nitrogen, phosphorus is important. So again, you could ask yourself the question, if we know that disturbance reduces mycorrhiza, what would disturbance mean for nitrogen fixation of soybean? And it has been studied by colleagues in Canada who found out that if you increase the phosphorus fertilizer and if you increase phosphorus levels, then you see a higher amount of nitrogen fixation. But what they also noted was that if you disturb your soil, the amount of nitrogen fixed by soybean is much smaller than in an undisturbed soil. And this difference, and again, you can also see this just over here, as the amount of phosphorus you need to add to have, for instance, 250 kilograms of nitrogen fixed is due to mycorrhizae. And people did study the same pattern. Uh, they had soybean plants uh, and then they disturbed the soil or not. They looked at mycorrhizal colonization and you can see that uh, if you disturb the soil just at the start of the experiments, then 10 days after uh, the plants emerge from the soil, you have much more colonization without disturbance. Also, after three weeks, you had a large difference, but after seven weeks, the plants were all very well colonized and there was a relatively small difference left. But like in the case of maize that we saw before, this initial effect of disturbance remained visible over the end of the experiment. So if you look at the amounts of nodules, even after the seven weeks when there was no difference in mycorrhizal colonization, or a very small one, the plants had still the same number of nodules, but the biomass of the nodules, so the size of the nodules was much larger 
if they did not disturb the soil. And so the amount of nitrogen fixed, uh, which was in the end uh, measured after those seven weeks, was three or four times larger without disturbance than which disturbance, and the fraction of nitrogen fixed showed the same pattern. So yes, the disturbance, especially at the start of the planting season, can work out very negative. And of course, farmers have good reasons to plow the soil, that is to get rid of some of the weeds, but at the same time, they create unfavorable conditions for mycorrhizae. So there should be questions, how can we still effectively reduce the weeds, uh, the weeds and suppress them, while at the same time, avoid disturbing the uh, mycorrhizal network that is of such large benefit. And that, of course, is a major challenge, how to do it. And maybe some weeds are less of a problem than, than others, and then we can disturb the soil less. <clears throat> I had a student from China, and we were also interested in how soil disturbance worked. And we did this in a field system. And so what we did compare was not um, plants with and without mycorrhiza, but plants with more and less mycorrhiza. And we also applied, like in the case before, the treatment with phosphorus fertilizer. And we tested, because we were interested in this issue of breeding plants for enhanced response to mycorrhiza, we tested land races of maize, we tested hybrids of maize, and we tested inbred lines. And you can see they are all a bit different, that especially at the highest phosphorus levels, the modern hybrids produce more than the land races or the inbred lines. And of course, uh, every maize breeder knows that that is a way to increase yield. But what interests us is the yield um, if we do not disturb the soil that's indicated in the solid lines and the yields that occur if we disturb the soil you can see that again that disturbing the soil reducing microizer colonization results in lower yields and you can also see that with the disturbance with 60 kilograms of phosphorus added we had roughly the same a biomass of plants than with 30 kilograms of phosphorus fertilizer without disturbance. So again, it suggests that we could save 30 kilograms of phosphorus fertilizer if we manage to reduce soil disturbance. And what we did with our student, uh, Qingxing Wang from uh, China Agricultural University, was to ask the economic question, what does that save? And so we did our calculations. We saw in the previous slide that if we reduce disturbance, we can save 30 kilograms phosphorus per hectare without having any effect on the yield. Um, the fertilizer level of 30 kilogram phosphorus per hectare without disturbance was the same as applying 60 kilogram phosphorus per hectare with disturbance. <clears throat> Well, then you can calculate how much that saves. We know that in the Netherlands, we have 200,000 hectares of maize. And I think you could easily check how much maize there would be in Indonesia or Vietnam or Malaysia. And you can just multiply those two numbers. And then we saw for the Netherlands, we could save 6,000 ton of phosphorus. The 200,000 hectares multiplied by 30 grams 30 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare. But you can calculate how much this phosphorus fertilizer costs. And again, uh, these are prices for the Netherlands, where a ton of phosphorus fertilizer costs around 1,500 euros. And you can easily do the same calculation for your own country if you check the prices of phosphorus fertilizer. And so if you save 6,000 ton of fertilizer that costs around one and a half thousand euros per ton of phosphorus, you save uh, just by adequate mycorrhizal uh, management, 
9 million euros in the Netherlands. <clears throat> and we did um, just more as an exercise for the whole world. Uh, I checked on the website of the FAO how much maize there was in the world. Uh, and I assumed that they would have the same savings possible. And then it came to a value of 400 million euros that we could save in terms of phosphorus fertilizer by adequately managing the mycorrhizal symbiosis. And I think it could still be an interesting exercise that you can do behind your computer that to calculate for more crops, how much savings would be possible, how much area those crops occupy, and hence what you can save, and especially what poor farmers can save if they invest more in management and invest less in mineral fertilizer. And again, this is mineral fertilizer, not organic fertilizers like green manures, because there the relationship would be somewhat different. <clears throat> well, this research by my student, Xin Xin Wang, was based on this idea um, that we showed before, that certain plant traits indicate more or less benefit from mycorrhiza, that if we compare different varieties of the same plant, we see differential benefits from mycorrhiza, which means that if crops and their wild ancestors or different varieties of crops um, are mycorrhizal but have different benefits, we could ask the biotechnologist to help us breed for better benefits. And so this is how the argument went. We know that the crops and the wild ancestors form mycorrhiza and profit from mycorrhiza. We also know that the plant breeders, when they select new varieties, they select them for high productivity, and they do that under conditions of a high nutrient supply. An industrial company that um, makes new maize varieties, new maize hybrids, does this in very well fertilized fields where nutrient levels are much higher than uh, what farmers usually apply. And at such very high nutrient levels, and also um, with the other practices that breeders apply, um, like the use of fungicides or tillites, they reduce mycorrhiza. So it is very likely that plant breeding has created breeding environments or breeding arenas that select from plant benefit from mycorrhiza. And that's what authors noted in the 1980s, that old cultivars are generally more responsive to mycorrhiza than modern cultivars. At least that's what they noticed for wheat, and we will see later on how general that is. And so when people noted that the breeding conditions, noted that old cultivars responded more to mycorrhiza than the modern cultivars, they said, well, it's likely that the mycorrhizal responsiveness has been reduced through breeding programs. And so if we want to increase agricultural sustainability, if we want to depend less on fertilizers, as we will run out of fertilizers in one or two centuries, then we need to rethink about introducing or reintroducing mycorrhizal responsiveness in breeding programs. And so it was an issue that has always interested me a lot. I had a PhD student who worked on that uh, with onions. And we'll see some examples. We had a student, Xin Xin Wang, whom I just presented data from, who was interested in that in maize. I have been working with him on breeding for cotton because cotton is a plant that uh, gets lots and lots and lots of fertilizers. And I recently, um, accepted that my final PhD students who will look at mycorrhiza in relation to the response of different varieties. <clears throat> and so if we do that kind of job, we should ask ourselves, what is mycorrhiza responsiveness? And we just have seen 
many cases of the yield increase of mycorrhizal plants to compared mycorrhizal plants. And I already told you that this is a relative parameter. And you can see here various ways it's being expressed, but it is always a ratio. So it says plants are 20% or 50% or whatever else larger. It does not include biomass as such. And as I mentioned, farmers, of course, look at big plants and not only at relative increases. And I will show this in a second that you would probably intuitively do the same. So there are problems with the use of this relative measure. One is that the relative measure of responsiveness always depends on how the plant without mycorrhiza performs. And so any case where this one is low, so if plants do poorly in the non-mycorrhizal condition, they are likely to show high responsiveness. And so we may not necessarily select what we want to select. And this is clearly shown in this case. And ask yourself the question, if you are a plant breeder and you know how the plants perform with and without mycorrhiza, here and here, would you as a plant breeder prefer this cultivar or would you as a plant breeder prefer this cultivar? Well, I guess that if you would ask a farmer whether he would like to work with this cultivar or this one, that all farmers would say, give me this cultivar rather than that one. But if you calculate the relative benefit from mycorrhiza, here, the relative benefit is much larger. Here, the plants became almost 20 times as big. And here, the plants became only 30 or 50% larger. And that is not due to because those plants here perform better than here. In fact, the plants here perform better, but because this specific variety that we created for breeding purposes performed especially poorly in the non-mycorrhizal condition. So by only using mycorrhizal responsiveness, we may select this plant, which has the very high mycorrhizal responsiveness, here, rather than these plants in which farmers are most interested. So that raises a problem when using mycorrhizal responsiveness. And I can tell you, if you go to the literature where people discuss breeding for responsiveness, there are still many papers where authors do not seem to be aware of this problem. It has been very well explained by David Janos in various papers, and we try to explain it our way as well in this paper in the journal called Theoretical and Applied Genetics. That if you use a relative measure for benefit from mycorrhiza, you may select plants that perform especially poorly in the non mycorrhizal condition, and that's not what we want. What we also did, and that was because I was happy to collaborate with plant breeders, was that we tried to map uh, certain traits on the chromosome so that we could see if we compare all the different varieties that we had, and you can see here we had lots of different uh, genotypes. And by comparing all those genotypes, you can find genetic markers, either on chromosomes or on linkage groups, which are likely chromosomes. And then you can map the traits that relate to mycorrhizal benefit. And what we found was that many of those traits for mycorrhizal responsiveness were also traits that related to root traits themselves. So the genetic markers for responsiveness were the same for certain root traits, which means that if you breed for mycorrhiza, you should start thinking about the root system of your plant. You should not just say, well, I'm going to breed for mycorrhiza you should realize that the benefit from mycorrhiza relates to the root rate. And so you can 
see that if uh, you are breeding for plants with thinner roots, then on average, uh, plants with thinner roots um, derive, do better in the non mycorrhizal condition. So if you breed your plants to form thinner roots, and many crop breeding has resulted in that, then indeed you find lower mycorrhizal responsiveness, lower for modern varieties than for old varieties. The same would be true if by our breeding system, uh, we have changed the hormonal balance. And if plants have thereby uh, root systems that are more branched, then again, the modern varieties would be less responsive than the old varieties, but not necessarily resulting in plants that we should not work with. And finally, if we have, that's what we also found out, if we have a larger yield stability, so the less variation in yield under a large range of conditions, then on average, the responsiveness to mycorrhiza has gone down. So many things that breeders have done may indeed have resulted in lower mycorrhizal responsiveness, but not necessarily in root systems that are less beneficial for plants. And there can also be cases where we have bred for crops with thicker roots, then mycorrhizal responsiveness has gone up. And if the breeding has changed the physiological uptake system, then again, the mycorrhizal responsiveness has gone up. And that is an interesting observation because people started uh, with this observation that mycorrhizal responsiveness of old varieties was higher than that of modern varieties. But now we know for maize, for instance, that modern varieties respond more to mycorrhiza than the older varieties in some cases. And with onion, we had a specific problem that the ones that had the high uh, responsiveness um, were generally less uh, forming bulbs. And we, into, we crossed onion with some neighboring species that had no bulbs. So we wanted both to improve the root system of onion, but we also wanted to maintain the bulbing quality. And we found out that the onion system with the larger roots and the larger benefit from mycorrhizas were also the ones that had poor bulbing capacity and the ones with better bulbing capacity had fewer roots. So that is a further issue that you need to think of. If you breed for mycorrhizal benefit, you will change all kinds of plant traits, including root traits. And if the root is part of the edible portion of the plant, uh, and this is the case in onion, although technically it's, it's not a root, uh, but the bulb is part of the stem, but still it's related to the root system, uh, then you may have those unexpected side effects. So we have to think more in what breeding has done. And this is a study uh, where they compared 20 different plants, uh, the wild ancestors of the domesticated varieties. You can see that in some cases, breeding has increased mycorrhizal benefit. And this is definitely the case with maize. There are other cases where breeding has reduced the responsiveness, which happens in uh, wheat, and which also happens in cotton. And we know if we relate this to how breeding has the root system, that with maize, the modern varieties have thicker roots than the older varieties. With cotton, the breeding has resulted in thinner plant roots and thereby in less mycorrhizal benefit. So it sounds like a very simple concept that we should breed for mycorrhizal responsiveness. But as soon as you start doing experiments, you realize that it is a much more complicated problem and that we cannot breed for mycorrhizal responsiveness unless we think how this would be related to the way plant breeding has modified plant roots. And so we should not only look at breeding for mycorrhizal responses, but breeding for root systems for sustainable agriculture. 
So there are various ways we can do. We can read for this mycorrhizal responsiveness. And we saw all the kinds of problems we have. We could try to breed plants for higher uh, root colonization, independent of the benefits they have. Or we could breed for plants that form mycorrhiza more quickly or that allow the fungus to produce more mycelium. And we could also try to breed for uh, mycorrhiza in ways that it reduces pathogen protection. Um, and we could uh, breed for plants that are more selective. And there was a question yesterday, to what extent plants uh, select the fungi they associate with. And maybe if we select plants that are more selective for certain beneficial fungi, we could also increase mycorrhizal benefits. And finally, we could breed the mycorrhizal fungi, although that has turned out to be very, very difficult. And there are only one or two papers in the literature where they have tried to breed the mycorrhizal fungi themselves. So almost everything relates to plant breeding, but there is a large way ahead in order to improve that. This was a study done um, in Africa or with African and German researchers where they had different varieties of, I think it was sorghum or millet. And you can see that uh, there is genetic variation in root colonization. So again, you could select uh, varieties that have higher colonization, or you could select varieties that have lower colonization. The problem that those authors noted in their study was that while there is genetic variation with this plant, there was little relationship between colonization and benefit. So there was a large amount of variation that was not explained by levels of root colonization, what we saw before. But more importantly, when the author started crossing the varieties with high root colonization, the outcome was not always that the descendants of those plants also had high root colonization. So the heritability and the chance that the next generation retains the trait of the parents of root colonization was relatively low. And so that makes this um, still a very difficult path to move forward. But yes, you can see this is all relatively recent work. So there are still many opportunities for the next generation of researchers to study this with more plants and to see whether there are cases where we can select plants for increased root colonization and therefore for increased mycorrhizal benefit. Here people try to do the same with wheat. And again, this is very recent work. So more work is to be done. And they found out that um, for different genotypes, um, there are very different levels of colonization. Uh, so you can still imagine that it would depend on which species you have in your field. I see you've been talking for around 45 minutes. So I suggest we take a break of two or three minutes so that I can have a, a glass of uh, water and then I continue in uh, three minutes from now. Is that okay? Sorry, Professor Kuiper. Are you still with us? I was still there. I was just getting a glass of water to uh, for my throat. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> and I thought if I take a glass of water, then the students should have a chance to also stretch the legs for one minute because sitting. Um, behind the screen for one and a half hours is sometimes a difficult job. <clears throat> but let me already prepare you for the next topic. And I must say, I find these pictures really beautiful. 
um, if you use different stains, you can stain the network of mycorrhizal fungi. You can even stain the individual nuclei in the mycorrhizal mycelium. Because I had no time to talk about that, but the genetic architecture of a buscular mycorrhizal fungi is very different from uh, what you are used to look at when you look at plants or animals or other fungi. We have individual cells and each cell of us has in principle one nucleus. If you look at an arbuscular mycorrhizal fungus, it has no cells and so there are no uh, walls uh, between it. So it's one large mycelium and there are many different nuclei in this whole compartment. So not cells with individual nuclei per cell, but the whole structure with thousands or ten thousands of different nuclei. And those nuclei are somewhat genetically different, and that results in a very complicated uh, genetic process in which I have no time to talk about, but if you're interested, I can provide you with some literature. What you can also see from those IV is that they branch eh, like roots do, but also they can come together again. So you can get all these kinds of connections. So you can move from this point to that point. By this way, you can just move in circles. So there are all these kinds of networks. And that is a very popular topic, what we call common mycorrhizal network. The way in which mycorrhizal fungi can connect different plants at the same time. Here you see two seedlings of a tree. Um, they have been inoculated by one mycorrhizal fungus. Um, and you can see the fungus grows towards each other. It's the same, it recognizes it the same, and they come together. So both plants are connected by the same mycorrhizal fungus in this mycorrhizal network. And people have had a lot of interest because they asked themselves what happens in a natural vegetation or in a mixed cropping system if different plants are connected by the same mycorrhizal network. If you do experimental research and you have one plant in a pot, then the whole question is not relevant. But if you have mixed vegetation, then the question is how do those fungi connect? And here you see a number of different plants. Well, plant species number four is not mycorrhizal, so it's not connected. Plant species three has an adult plant and a young seedling. And you can see the seedling is connected to the adult plant by this mycorrhizal network. Here you have another plant of species four, again, not mycorrhizal. Here is a plant of species one and it's connected in its mycorrhizal network with plant species two. It's also connected with plant species three in its network. And plant species three itself is also connected to plant species two in this mycorrhizal network. So there is a whole underground system for which plants are being connected. And in those connections, plants can move around or the fungus can move around between different plants. Carbon, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, they can move around water so that plants um, who have deeper roots transport water to surface layers and then through the mycorrhizal network it is brought to other plants. And scientists in India have done very interesting work to show how deep rooting plants can provide water for shallow rooting plants in that system through mycorrhiza. And what we think can also happen, although this is still a bit under debate, is that plants can even through those uh, connections um, send signals by which they warn each other. So if a plant gets attacked nearby all kinds of animals that eat leaves, plants release certain compounds, volatile organic compounds. They can be 
perceived and taken up by the neighboring plant and induce the defense system. If you would put a bag over this plant and if you would exclude the release through the air of those warning compounds, then you still can see that those plants increase the production of defense compounds. And that's due uh, to the fact that plants have this mycorrhizal network. If you connect the uh, disconnect the mycorrhizal network, or if you have non mycorrhizal plants, if you then put a bag on this plant, then this plant does not respond to the herbivores. If there is a mycorrhizal network, then even if you prevent any transport through the air, we know there is transport of and communication by chemicals below ground by that mycorrhizal network. So there can be benefits in terms of that transfer, and that can also result in plants relatively benefiting more from that network than others. And this was a system where they grew flax and sorghum together, um, or as two flax plants, or as two sorghum plants. And they grew them together without mycorrhiza or with mycorrhiza. And you can see from the picture that flax benefited a lot from the mycorrhiza, and that sorghum, well, hardly benefited from the mycorrhiza. So people ask themselves, what is happening below ground? We know that those plants are connected by a common mycorrhizal network. If we have two flax plants, they remain much smaller. And if you have a flax plant and a sorghum plant, so apparently something is happening in the exchange of nutrients between sorghum and flax. Well, they had a very ingenious system uh, by which they labeled their plants, by which they labeled the mycorrhizal fungi, they labeled soil nutrients, and they figured out that in such a network, the, the most of the nutrients, most of the phosphorus, most of the nitrogen in that system went to the flax, but when it came to the carbon, so the food for the fungus, at least in this case, most of it was paid by sorghum. So the larger plant, so to speak, subsidized the smaller plant, and that's why flax so increased. If they did the same thing with the different mycorrhizal fungal species, they still saw that most of the carbon was paid by sorghum and not by flax, but that the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus both plants get was a bit more equally divided. Well, that system can be very beneficial, of course, if you have an adult plant and a seedling, because a small seedling may not have much carbon to provide to the mycorrhizal fungus. And so if the older plant provides the carbon, the seedling may benefit in that system and thereby um, have a larger chance to survive. The same could happen in intercropping, and when you plant plants different in time, when you plant uh, legumes and later on plant maize, uh, then uh, plants can benefit by being supported by the other in the mycorrhizal network. And so you get, and that is of course what farmers are interested in most, if you grow sorghum and flax together, you get more yield than if you grow only flax in your field uh, and in another field only sorghum. So technically, you save space by growing flax and sorghum together rather than having one field with flax and another field with sorghum. Because for sorghum, it doesn't matter whether it grows next to another sorghum plant or next to a flax plant. But for flax, it's much more beneficial to grow next to a sorghum plant and to another flax plant. And so we were interested in that as well. And together with Xin Xin Wang, again, my Chinese PhD student, we asked ourselves, does this only work for different plant species? Or could you also mix different varieties? And people have been mixing varieties of the same species for different reasons. We know that you can mix rice varieties if some of them are very sensitive to pathogens, 
in some models are not, then you can reduce the damage by those pathogens in rice field. We were interested in knowing whether mycorrhiza could play a role if we grew two varieties together uh, and then see whether this would produce more than if we grow them on separate fields. And so this is how it looks like. And of course, this is a lab experiment and you also need to test it in the field. But you grow two maize plants, this variety, two maize plants, this variety, or one maize plant, this and this variety, and the other of the other variety. And then you look at whether the biomass of those two varieties is more than the, my, the average biomass of one plant here and one plant of this other variety. Well, he did that, and he did that in two different years. And you can see if there is no mycorrhiza around, then there is no difference between what you would expect from the two varieties growing alone or the varietal mixing. As soon as you make your plants mycorrhizal, you can see an increase. This was significant, this was significant, this was significant, so biomass and uh, phosphorus content, and this was marginally significant with p-value between 5 and 10 percent. So you can see that having mycorrhiza not only resulted in larger plants, because this is much larger than this one, this is much larger than this one, but also by having more yield than you would predict from the individual maize plants. And that was something that we found very surprising. So we were wondering what was happening. And we did that in the field and in the pot. And we saw that there was more high length, so a larger network, if you mix two different varieties than if you have each variety in its own field. And this was very clear in the field. It was marginally significant in one year in the pot. So we need to study more and we need to understand why having different varieties led to more mycorrhiza. And having more mycorrhiza means in this case, having more activity of enzymes that allow the plant to acquire phosphorus from organic sources. So not mineral phosphorus as a mineral fertilizer, but organic phosphorus that you may get if you apply organic fertilizers like green manure. And you can see that with mycorrhiza, you increase the ability of the plants to require organic phosphorus in mixtures. It was very surprising and we still don't know exactly how this works. Although we think that mycorrhizal fungi are associated with bacteria that have this ability to access phosphorus from organic sources. And so having more uh, mycorrhiza means having more of those bacteria, which means more phosphorus available. And so that's what we then saw. If we have more high for length, or if we have more mycorrhiza colonization with mixing, we generally have more yield. So we have significant relations between beneficial effects of mixing on mycorrhizal colonization or the size of the mycorrhizal network and the yield increases in the pot. But you can also see from this graph that there is a very large amount of variation. And so we still need to understand why some of the combinations are much better than others. That's what Xin Xin currently is doing to see how we can select in the best possible way combinations where we have the largest benefit in terms of colonization and yield, rather than having much smaller benefits or even no benefit at all. And that's unknown, so that's certainly something you can do yourself in future experiments. So that's what we concluded, that if you mix different varieties, you have more mycorrhiza in the plant roots, you have a larger mycorrhizal network in the soil. And most likely, although we did not have very good data for that, we have likely more different fungal species in 
those soils. And so if you then mix them, if there is mycorrhiza, you produce more than you would predict. That's what we call overyielding. And that means that you could save land by mixing your plants only when the plants are mycorrhizal. And that's due because in not fully known ways, that the plants, the two different varieties do different things. And if I may speculate a bit, because we have not very good data, but um, it would be suggested that especially if you include an old land race in such mixtures, they have a larger ability to mobilize phosphorus from organic sources. And that's how it works better. Mixing two modern hybrids is possibly less efficient than mixing a modern hybrid with an older variety because they are a bit more different in what they do with the mycorrhizal association. And we think um, when it comes to the mechanism, if you mix those varieties, you increase the conditions for the fungus. So you get a larger mycorrhizal network, you get larger root colonization, that translates into larger phosphorus uptake. And as the plant productivity was limited by phosphorus, more phosphorus uptake means more biomass and hence more yields or land safe. And so we know it happens in pots and it likely happens in the field. And so it means that intercropping, both growing two crops at the same time or growing two varieties in the same field at the same time can result in increases in yield and saving of land and that mycorrhiza plays a role in that overyielding. So again, if you grow more than one crop in the same piece of land, you will see many farming systems around the world where people grow legumes and cereals together, or like in Mexico, where they have a system called Three Sisters, where they grow beans and maize and the squash uh, together, that you get more yield. And that is due to the fact that the plants use different soil resources, but that they also helped in that differential use of the soil resources by the mycorrhizal symbiosis. Well, let me then <coughs> go briefly to um, other benefits of mycorrhiza. This was what I mentioned yesterday. And I will only deal briefly with the question about the protection that plants may receive from mycorrhiza. There were questions about it yesterday. There could be equal questions. And there was also a question yesterday about a weed suppression, but I don't have the time to deal with that. So let's only look at the protection against pathogens and herbivores. And for that, we go back to a slide I showed yesterday, in which I said, well, if you have a very poorly branched system of thick roots, then there is a lot of benefits for mycorrhiza in terms of nutrient uptake. And the thinner roots and the more branch you get, the less it gets. But at the same time, there may be other uh, benefits for the plant that depends on the root system. And especially the protection against pathogens may be larger with highly branched root systems. People have looked at different mechanisms, what mycorrhiza can do. Sometimes it would increase the nutrient quality eh? because plants, as I showed yesterday, may contain more nitrogen and phosphorus and may therefore suffer more. But especially when it comes to protection, if there is a mycorrhizal fungus in the root, there is less space for the enemies of the plant to say, stay in that root. If the mycorrhizal fungus and gets used and get access to the carbon of the plant, there may be less carbon for the enemies. And then there may be all kinds of changes in that root system. Uh, so the plant may change its branching, may change the chemistry close to the root, or the plants may activate the defense mechanism. And the red carpet that I showed yesterday, which is intended to keep the mycorrhizal fungus in, but other enemies out, may in fact result in a plant that is even better able to keep these 
and they leak out. But just let us look not only at what theory tells us, but what some of the data show. This is a study of a, a grass, so a plant with very thin, very branched roots, where there is very little benefit of the microbial symbiosis. And here the authors did a very simple experiment. You have a control plant without mycorrhiza and without a pathogen. You have a plant with mycorrhiza without a pathogen, with a pathogen without mycorrhiza, and with a pathogen and mycorrhiza. And you can see if you have the plant without pathogen and without mycorrhiza, adding mycorrhiza has no effect on the root, on the biomass of the plant and on the length of the root. So indeed, no benefit of mycorrhiza in the absence of the pathogen. If you add pathogen in the absence of mycorrhiza, which is this case, you see that the plant clearly suffers from the pathogen. You get less shoot weight, you get lower root length. But if you have the pathogen and the mycorrhizal fungus around, again, you can see that there is no effect of the pathogen anymore. So yes, there is a benefit of mycorrhiza, but only if there is a pathogen at the same time. If there is no pathogen, there is no benefit of mycorrhiza. Well, people have been looking at all the studies that have been published, and there are hundreds of studies. And you can see that in general, there is a protective effect. So there is a positive effect of mycorrhiza in the presence of pathogens. The pathogen damage is reduced because most of the cases, the plants perform better than without pathogens. When it comes to nematode damage, as you can see here, there is a very small effect or even an increase and maybe even more damage by nematodes. And so mycorrhiza especially protect plants against fungal pathogens, but less so against nematodes. But yes, mycorrhizal management could play a role in biocontrol. They have done more studies also with above ground herbivores. And again, they found a small positive effect uh, on uh, what was happening, but it depends very much on the specific kind of insect herbivores that you have and how specialized they are. Um, herbivores, uh, insects that eat plants that are very generalist and eat many different plants, and um, there the effect is different than if plants are highly specialized to a certain microbial fungus. But the question is, how important is this for the farmer? And how important is this for you if you're going to work together with the farmers? And then you should realize that the effectiveness of the system is easily demonstrated under controlled conditions, but it's much harder to show the effects in the field. What we often do in the lab is that we first add the mycorrhizal fungus and then later add the pathogen. That gives a very clear protective effect, but in the field, the pathogen does not always wait till the mycorrhizal fungus is in the plant. So competition, when you add them at the same time, may be another factor and our studies may be a bit biased. We do not know whether the effect um, remains there for more than one season. So we may have to add mycorrhiza or to improve our mycorrhizal management each and every year. And then finally, and that has shown to be a practical problem because when people saw that certain mycorrhizal fungi were quite effective in reducing pests, they wanted to have the mycorrhizal fungi registered us as biocontrol agents. But the legislation in Europe is very complicated, which means you need to do lots and lots of testing before you can register such um, mycorrhizal fungal strain as a biocontrol agent. And that is so expensive compared to the use of chemicals that there are no admitted mycorrhizal products on the market. 
It does not say that it doesn't work. And farmers can definitely try to manage them, but it's not something you can buy in shop. Well, then very briefly, um, something about the unwanted effects that I showed yesterday, where we have some cases of a negative response. And we think it may have to do with situations where there is too little um, nitrogen. Because the fungal mycelium also contains a lot of nitrogen. And in fact, per unit biomass, the fungus contains around 10 times as much nitrogen as the plant. So if there are situations where there is nitrogen limitation, there may be cases where the mycorrhizal benefit is very low. And that's what I showed at the start of my lectures for today. If phosphorus is limiting and if there is enough nitrogen, then um, plants they will benefit from mycorrhiza. If there is either a lot of phosphorus around or too little nitrogen, or both of them, the plants may not have those benefits. And that was shown over here. And where you can see that if you increase nitrogen levels, you increase the mycorrhizal benefit. If you then add more phosphorus, there's no effect. And with very little nitrogen, it was even a negative response uh, to mycorrhiza. So yes, the mycorrhiza don't like phosphorus fertilizer as mineral fertilizer, but the same is not the case for mineral nitrogen fertilizer. And so it is important to think in terms of balanced nutrition and standard mineral fertilizers with fixed amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus may not be ideal in such case. And that brings me to the final questions about management. How should we manage mycorrhiza? So we should think about the practices that select for or against mycorrhizal fungi. If we have very frequent plowing or tillage, we reduce mycorrhiza. If we reduce tillage, we increase the benefits. If we have crops that we grow only for three months, and if we have a long time fallow, then we select against mycorrhiza. If we increase the crop longevity, or if we plant perennial crops in our system, we select for mycorrhizal fungi that live longer, are already there at the start of the growing season, which again increases mycorrhizal benefits. If we lower the amount of nutrients, we may select for certain mycorrhizal fungi. And again, we increase mycorrhizal benefits. So yes, management consists to a large extent of thinking about management practices. Think about tillage, how you disturb the mycorrhizal network. Think about the amount of nutrients um, and avoid excess, and especially avoid excess of phosphorus because that's far more negative than nitrogen. Avoid fungicides. It's not mentioned here, but with many fungicides, you kill the mycorrhizal fungi as well. And yes, think about cropping systems where crops stay longer in the field so that the mycorrhizal network is there for a longer time period. And you see in various agricultural systems, agroforestry, perennial agriculture, a tendency to include the more. And if you do those practices, you manage mycorrhiza and you don't need to buy a mycorrhizal inoculum. Because if you would start to search on Google for mycorrhiza, you would find many websites where they say, you can buy mycorrhiza with us. If you add that to the field, you would solve all problems. But I would state, and that's what's the message of this slide is as well, that in many cases, it's not an issue of buying mycorrhizal inoculum, that it is often a waste of money, but that you should manage your mycorrhizal. So what you should ask yourself before you start investing your money on mycorrhizal inoculum, are there mycorrhizal fungi present in the field? 
if there are enough present in the field, and if they are sufficiently um, effective in the management system you have, then inoculation is not required. You only should buy inoculum if there are no enough fungi in the field, and if it's unlikely that from neighboring sites, mycorrhizal inoculum is brought in. In all other cases, uh, you still would have possibility of managing the mycorrhiza in the field. And so it's quite exceptional under field conditions for farmers that you should buy inoculum and introduce them. And then if you do so, and that's what those authors ask, is there indeed a large reward than the risk? Because most of the commercial inoculum may not be the best inoculum that you can get. Um, and that's what people tested. And they looked at um, local inoculum, so the mycorrhiza that is in the field, and they looked at the commercial inoculum that they bought, and they grew them with the different cultivated plants or crops with different wild plants. And you can see, if you look at the amount of arbuscles, uh, and these are the organs where there is the exchange between um, the fungus and the phosphate provided by the fungus and the carbohydrates provided by the plants, that the local inoculum produces much more arbuscles than the commercial inoculum, both with cultivated and with wild plants. If you look at the number of spores, uh, and these cost carbon, and these are needed because of the annual cropping system, but not necessarily of benefit, then there is much more spores in the commercial inoculum than in the uh, local inoculum. So the commercial inoculum does have properties that are a bit less suitable for optimal mycorrhizal symbiosis than the inoculum you often find yourself. So again, suggesting that management is more important than buying inoculum. And that brings me to my final slate slide for today. And that's the take home messages or the don'ts uh, and do's for mycorrhizal management. So the first thing is managing mycorrhizae is more important than buying and adding commercial inoculum. And if you manage mycorrhizae, there are three don'ts. And that is to avoid high amounts of mineral phosphorus fertilizer, which we have seen that works negatively for the fungus. Avoid soil disturbance as much as possible, as that destroys the network. Avoid the use of fungicides, as that will kill the fungus. And there are a number of do's in mycorrhizal management. I think about mixing plant species or plant varieties in, in the cropping systems. Increase cover and so avoid uh, bare fallows because that would select for fungi that maintain the network over the whole year and not select for fungi that only produce spores to survive the unfavorable season. Think about crop rotations so that you change one crop by the other, both to reduce pathogen pressure, but also to uh, maintain a larger diversity of mycorrhizal fungi. And then finally, think about the varieties that you select. And if you select your varieties for benefit from mycorrhizae, think about the roots of those plants as much as you have to think about the mycorrhizal fungi. And I think that with this slide, um, which summarizes what I want to tell you today, uh, you can just think about how your knowledge of the mycorrhizal symbiosis is not only important for your formation as an academic, but is especially important as your program certainly prepares you for to help the world achieve more sustainable agriculture, where we produce more food, more healthy food with less damaging the environment. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. It is very well explanation about mycorrhizae. Uh, 
um, from your presentation, I can highlight that intensive agriculture may lessen the benefit of mycorrhiza due to a high number of nutrient availability added from fertilizer. In contrast, plant response to mycorrhiza were higher in phosphorus and nitrogen limitation. Inoculated plants with mycorrhiza will yield higher plant biomass than those which is not. Therefore, we can conclude that plants show high response to mycorrhiza. If the abundance of mycorrhiza is insufficient uh, in the soil, so it needed to introduction of mycorrhizal fungus, fungi strain. However, managing natural mycorrhiza is more important than aging commercial uh, inoculum. Um, well, now we are in the discussion session. Before starting the discussion, I please to all of the audience to take a quick break. And uh, for the audience who want to ask some question, please raise your hand by clicking raise hand icon in your Zoom room. Or for uh, the audience who followed this guest lecturing from YouTube, you can type your question and the committee will help me to collect uh, the question. Okay. Um, okay, one person raised hand, uh, Dina Hadi Solika. <clears throat> well, what we now do, eh, people have been using stains, um, there are certainly more modern methods uh, that you can apply in the lab. One is to use a specific compound, a specific fatty acid that is only produced by a vasculomycolite fungi. So that is often used because then you can estimate both what's in the root and estimate what's in the soil. That's the neutral lipid fatty acid, um, 16 um, colon 1 omega 5. And you can find that in the textbooks. You can use molecular methods by isolating DNA, which is another way of finding out how much mycorrhiza there is in the root or how much mycorrhiza there is in the soil. And so these are relatively simple, if you have a molecular biology lab, alternative ways, which are more time efficient. If you do this by this, that the acid analysis, you can do more samples in a short time than by the microscope. But of course, you have more cost for the analysis. Um, you cannot see them with the naked eye. So there are no alternatives for either the microscope or those chemical methods. Yes, we have uh, one microbial uh, biology uh, laboratory in our department. And hopefully yeah. after this, um, this guest lecturing, we can um, develop our uh, research to um, to be, uh, make uh, mycorrhizas topic bigger than before. Yeah. We have um, from our department of soil quality, yes. we yeah. have developed a website that's called Biosis, which gives indications how to assess soil quality. And that includes ways of assessing mycorrhizal symbiosis with reference to the literature for the various methods. So you can just check. I want to, if you want to know how to assess mycorrhiza in the field to assess soil quality, you can click on that link and it tells you the different methods. It provides a reference to the methods so that you can easily replicate it. And it often mentions the benefits and disadvantages. And I think the website is operational by now. Sure. Thank you very much. Well, um, we back to the discussion session. Um, Gina Hadisoli, probably you have some questions to Professor Clifford, please. Uh, thank you for opportunity. And of course, I uh, for the amazing presentation you have shared. So I have been read about foraging petition on your journal, and I would ask some uh, question. Are foraging precision related to the ability for this mycorrhizal in finding the right food according to their type? Then 
Why forage precision in legume plants is lower than cereal? It is because legume has root nodule, so that the role of mycorrhizal become less. Thank you. Well, to start with the final question, in general, um, legumes benefit more from mycorrhiza than cereals. And that has to do with the fact that cereals on average have thinner roots and also because legumes have a much higher phosphorus demand than other plants. And so if as a plant you have a larger need for mycorrhizal fungi, you may be less selective with which fungi you associate because almost any fungus brings some benefit. But there is a very interesting question here and I think that nobody up to now has addressed it. If you go back to soybean and if you look in the literature, then you have what's called promiscuous soybean. That's the soybean they apply in Africa. That's a soybean that can associate with almost any nitrogen fixing bacterium. So that um, means that wherever you plant your soybean, there will be some nitrogen fixing bacteria around and you get some soybean growth. In the United States, on the other hand, they have soybean fields where they have selected rhizobia that are very, very efficient. And those soybean plants are very selective. So they only associate with those rhizobia and not or hardly with us. Well, we know that rhizobia use the same um, recognition system with plants that was originally um, evolved with the mycorrhizal symbiosis. So it could be possible that we can breed plants uh, to start with soya, but also other plants that are more or less selective in the mycorrhizal fungi they select. And as we know that the benefit by different mycorrhizal fungi is different, selecting plants for higher selectivity could be worthwhile. But it's up to now a completely theoretical idea. I have checked the literature, um, but I could not find any paper where promiscuous and highly selective soybeans have been tested uh, for the extent to which they're also selective or not for mycorrhizal fungi. So that's definitely a project, and not only with soybean, but also for other plants uh, that people could easily study. Thank you, Professor Kripper. Um, if they answer your question, uh, Gina? No, thank you, Miss. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Um, another discussion? I see Sharifanur. Sharif Anur has uh, written in the comment room. Probably you want to ask uh, to the professor Kuiper directly. Please um, unmute your microphone. You're still on mute. Your microphone is still mute. It's also the microphone of your computer that you need to switch on. Not only um, of the Zoom program, but also of the computer. Okay, probably I can uh, read your question, which you have typed uh, in the comment. Please. Yeah, let's do it that way. Uh, Um, Mr. Sharifin Noor asks about uh, the mycorrhizal fungi colonization leaves and combined with photosynthetic bacteria and how about some practical experience of using mycorrhiza, specifically in fruit trees? Well, to start with the first question, um, mycorrhizal fungi do only occur in roots, do not occur in above ground parts, so there can be no association between mycorrhizal fungi and any organism that is in stems or in leaves or whatever else. So that is something that is not possible. 
what is possible and what is something that people started to realize much more is that it's not only the mycorrhizal fungus. Hey, you may have the impression from what I said that it's just a mycorrhizal fungus. But we know that on the walls of the hyphal mycelium, there are bacteria, there are um, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, there are those bacteria that can increase access to organic phosphorus. And so there may be specific associations between mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria in the soil uh, that are something that have been underexplored. There are also um, several suggestions in the literature that there are associations between mycorrhizal fungi and certain nitrogen fixing bacteria. And so there is some further work to be added. Then when it comes to mycorrhizae in trees, I have focused indeed on um, annual cropping systems, but you can imagine that if you have plantation with cocoa or with coffee or whatever else, those plants are also mycorrhizal that you would have the same benefits. But yes, in those perennial systems, disturbance plays less of a role. Okay? So this issue of plowing the soil is not so important. But the use of fungicides can, can also be important there. And also the use of fertilizers can be an issue. And you can, of course, have uh, tree systems. You can have tree systems with plants like cocoa or coffee in the undergrowth. You can also have agroforestry systems where you have, let's say, maize fields, but where you have trees um, also planted with it that also help to maintain the mycorrhizal network. Very much. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, another discussion uh, from Beauty Beauty Laras, right? Okay. Please unmute your uh, microphone first. Okay. Thank you for your opportunity. May I ask uh, about? Can you speak a bit more loudly, please? Okay. Uh, can you hear my voice? Yeah. Far better. Yes. Uh, uh, may I ask about application of uh, mycorrhiza in salinity soil? Uh, how about the mechanism of mycorrhiza in salinity soil? It make a uh, plant tolerant in salinity soil or what? And uh, how about your opinion? It uh, efficient or not? Thank you. I think it's a very uh, important question. I have not worked much on that problem, but one of the papers that Novalia suggested was about eucalyptus in salinity soils. When it comes to the mechanisms, um, there are um, at least two major mechanisms. One is that it's because um, saline soils are for a plant like dry soils, eh, that there is too little water. And so the modification of stomatal conductance and the maintenance of photosynthesis plays a major role. The other effect is that with mycorrhiza, there is much more selective uptake of potassium over sodium, which reduces the effect of salinity. It's especially the sodium ion that's a problem. And we know that non-mycorrhizal plants have a much more unfavorable ratio of potassium to sodium than mycorrhizal plants. So it's the specific regulation of sodium versus potassium uptake, and it's the effect on the photosynthetic mechanisms that play a role. And there are also some roles of um, reactive um, oxygen species. In very saline soils, there are usually not that many mycorrhizal fungi. But in mildly saline soils, as we reported for eucalyptus, there can definitely be a mycorrhizal benefit. Um, but I, I am not well enough uh, knowledgeable about all the studies, uh, but if you would read the study on eucalypt, and that's freely available on the internet, you can get some of that literature, both how it works and under what conditions. Uh, but too much salt is something the mycorrhizal fungus doesn't like. You may have to select mycorrhizal fungi themselves that are adapted to saline conditions. So if you just buy commercial inoculum, again, it may not be adapted. If you would go to soils that are a bit 
um, affected by salt, then the mycorrhizal fungi there may be much better. Thank you very much. Um, is there answer your question, Judy? Yes. Thank you. Um, I saw Mr. Halbert um, raising his hand. If he can directly ask your question, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Hello again, Professor. Uh, uh, it's really uh, interesting presentation that you, you shared today. Uh, and you already, uh, my question is, some of them is already, you already answered it from the previous uh, 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 previous person about the mycorrhizal associated bacteria. I just, uh, uh, I would like to ask is either this uh, mycorrhizal associated bacteria is only found in uh, arbuscular mycorrhiza only, or it also can be found in uh, ectomycorrhiza too. And then another question is, what is the role of this bacteria? Is it helping the mycorrhiza or it's helping the plant or it's helping both of them? And yeah. also the last one is about the, is this bacteria is a specific to only to the specific plant and specific uh, mycorrhiza only or any type of bacteria can, can, uh, can make association with uh, mycorrhiza? Thank you. Okay, well, um... To start with the first, um, they also occur with ectomycorrhizal fungi, and there they are called mycorrhizal helper bacteria. If you would look for that word, uh, you see them. It's not always known exactly what they are doing. The idea is that those mycorrhizal helper bacteria with ectomycorrhiza um, make the process of mycorrhiza formation more efficient. And of course, that helps both the fungus and the plant. When it comes to those bacteria that occur, um, that is not always easy to determine because they are often very close to the cell wall. So you need to assess them. Um, and so there are some molecular studies. What we have found out, uh, but not yet published, is that um, we have different uh, phosphate solubilizing bacteria on the cell walls of different mycorrhizal fungi. But that is one study. And so we do not know um, how this specificity comes about. And you can imagine if they are close to the cell wall that they may already be in the spores. And there are other cases where fungi start their life in the or the bacteria start their life in the spores of the mycorrhizal fungus and are transferred together with it. In other cases, they may occur in the soil and be selected by the mycorrhizal fungus. And I think our current knowledge is insufficient to understand what's happening and what they are doing. I think it's a bit the same as what's called plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. That they can solubilize phosphorus, but they can also affect the hormonal status of the plant. And so we um, have we have terms to describe those organisms, but we don't know exactly what they are. Uh, but we know that um, bacteria of the genus Pseudomonas are often included among those specific um, mycorrhizal fungi that you find in as uh, bacteria that you find associated with mycorrhizal fungi. But also with Pseudomonas, you have all kinds of bad guys, the pathogens. So um, you cannot say, well, let's just uh, add uh, Pseudomonas because then you may have some real trouble. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you very much for the explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there another uh, discussion? from the audience uh, who followed this guest lecturing from Zoom room. Or probably the committee. Um, if, is there any question you collected from uh, YouTube? No? No other discussion? OK. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, now we are in the end of the program. I thank you very much to Professor Quiver for the great um, knowledge and experience about mycorrhizas you have given to us in two days.
and for all of the soil science department and uh, all of the students thank you very much for joining our program may all the knowledge we have gained can be useful for all of us and we can see each other again uh, very soon in another and better occasion online or offline after this COVID pandemic era before i close the program i would like to award the certificate of appreciation to Professor Kuiper for your kind support to our student and institution. I see a question here in the chat and that may be relevant for more. If there are some specific questions, um, you can uh, email me um, and let me put my email in the chat. So um, if there is something for people who want to get in touch with me. Okay. Um, here, um, the committee then will email you. Um, email, then you can send a mail to ask a specific question. Um, but um, note that um, this is autumn in the Netherlands, and I have some other opportunities, so it may take some time before you get a response. But um, uh, if you have some questions left, I'd be happy to see whether I can uh, help you with that. Thank you very much for the. Um, your, the opportunity to contact you by email after this case lecture is over. Okay, well, committee, would you please to uh, share the certificate of appreciation to Professor Weeper on behalf of uh, Dean of Faculty Agriculture, Georgia University. I thank you very much uh, to Professor uh, Thomas Weeper for your kind support to our students and our institution. Welcome. So, um, yes, we still have a bit noise here. Mm -hmm. um, you you can see on your screen, uh, it is the certificate of appreciation given uh, from our dean, Dr. Insinyur Damanhuri MS, to Professor uh, Dr. Thomas Kuiper from Wageningen University and Research in Netherlands. Thank you for uh, your willingness to give your knowledge, to share your knowledge about micro research in this today's guest lecturing. Thank you very much. And Thank you, fine. and I wish you all good luck in working with the farmers to create this more sustainable agriculture. And with that, I'm sure you will not forget about the micro -items. Thank you very much for the support. Um, and finally, I am Novalia Kusumarini, the moderator of today's program, as for leaving the meeting. And once more, I say thank you very much to Professor Clipper, to uh, all of the lecturer staff uh, of Soil Science Department who followed this guest lecturing and all of the audiences. And finally, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon to Professor Thomas Clipper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Professor Thomas Kuiper. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.